You're listening to the Two Guys and One Gun podcast here at Guns.com. What's going on, y'all? This is Alexander with the Two Guys, One Gun podcast brought to you by Guns.com. I'm here with my co-host, Mr. Chris Eager. And today we have a very interesting subject to talk about. We're going to discuss one of the, if not the most famous or infamous, depending on which side of the fence you land on, uh, surplus rifles in the United States, probably around the world. And that is the Mosin-Nagant, Mazin-Nagant, whatever you want to call it. There's all kinds of pronunciations out there. The old garbage rod. Um, pretty interesting rifle. And I'd love to really kind of just straight in, get into the history of, uh, of the Mosin. But, uh, you know, probably one of the most mass-produced bolt-action rifles in the history of the world, still seeing service today. The rifle came into existence in 1891. They're still being found on the front lines in the war in Ukraine currently. And one of the most interesting things to me about the Mosin Nagant is the 7.62x54R round. You know, back in the late 1890s, uh, early 1900s, there were a lot of cartridges that were developed by tons of countries. You had 8 millimeter Mauser, 30-06, 303 British, um, 65 Creedmoor, there's all, or 65 Swede, excuse me, all these calibers, and pretty much every single one of them has fallen out of service, except for the 7.62x54R. And uh, as far as I know, and I could be wrong, but as far as like major militaries around the world, it might be the only rimmed cartridge left, you know, um, in in kind of mainline service. But let's dig in. What's uh, what's uh, what's your thoughts on the old the old Russian garbage rod? Yeah, well, you know the uh, the the Russians, especially the Czarist Russians, uh, they had hard, a hard time with. Uh, heavy and light industry you know their agrarian culture you know the, the the food basket of europe they uh basically had to import uh anything they, that they needed industrialized you know and the military was no exception i mean for years they used uh french designed or german designed artillery pieces uh when it came to small arms the uh the rifle that the uh Mazen replaced was the burden rifle which was a, a single, single shot, shot yep. bolt action, you know, a breech loader that was developed by, you know, Hiram Burden, you know, an American. So, you know, you can really look at the, uh, uh, the Moisin Nagant as, I mean, it was kind of sort of uh, a Russian hybrid because, you know, you had the Nagant brothers, uh, which, you know, developed all sorts of, uh, mainly pistols uh, and revolvers in uh, Eastern, I'm sorry, Western Europe, uh, Belgium, uh, that were very popular with, you know, Scandinavian militaries and, and uh, smaller militaries around the world. They, the guys who also invented the uh, uh, M1895 uh, Nagant revolver, you know, for the uh, the Tsar. Uh, so, you know, the, the M91, you know, is kind of a, a hybrid between the, the Nagant brothers and, you know, uh, uh, Russian uh, uh, ordnance uh, officer named uh, Moisin. So he wound up with a Moisin the gun, you know. So super popular with the Tsar, you know, they cranked them out. Some of the original ones were made in uh, France because at the time France was a big ally with the Russians. They counted on the Russians being able to uh, send a couple of uh, army groups into uh, Sicilia and uh uh, German East Prussia in the event of a great war, and that's what actually happened in August 1914. Uh, but to get the the Russian army stood up at that point, the uh, French, you know, helped them with uh, a lot of behind the scenes stuff, and they actually produced a lot of the original uh, Mazins before the uh, Czars spooled up their own uh, production at places like Tula and, and Izvesk and uh, so on and so forth. And you know, there's so many. Millions of them were developed and, and made for the Russian army. Um, you know, it's an interesting story. There was one of the the first uh, uh, true battles of smokeless powder bolt-action magazine-fed rifles were between the, uh, to the Japanese and the Russians in 1904-1905 when they faced off with the Russians uh, uh, 
uh, over Port Arthur in the uh, the Manchurian area, you know, the Russia-Japanese War. So that's kind of an interesting, you know, tidbit, like side quest uh, for, for Ma uh, Mazen lovers, you know. Um, that was a cool conflict. I mean, the Russians had like Madsen uh, light machine guns from Denmark. Again, you know, they were they were buying stuff from everybody, uh, you know, but they, they kept on with the, the, the Moisen throughout uh, the Great War, the Jews on both sides and the uh, Russian Civil War is a brutal conflict that's often overlooked in the West. Uh, millions perished on each side. It was it was kind of an interesting bit where in 1917, you know, the Russians are like, you know, oh, we're we're sick of fighting. You know, we had 14 million men in the field and and lost two or three million to the Germans and the Austrians and the Turks. You know, nobody even has a count of it. You know, so we're not going to fight anymore. So they promptly got out of the Great War. And then wound up fighting themselves, you know, for another, you know, four to five years, depending on how you, you look at the, the end date for the Russian Civil War. And millions more died, you know, so they weren't that sick of fighting, <laughs> if you, you look at it like that. So then, uh, again, like the, the Reds kept it and and they put it back into production. They modified it a lot. You started seeing the shorter models like the uh, the 9130s, you know, that were... Uh, a lot of the older Zaris their guns were converted to 9130s in the, the kind of interwar era. And uh, they really thought, you know, going into uh, their buildup for what became the Second World War, uh, Uncle Joe Stalin and the gang, you know, they were like, oh, we're going to modernize our military. We're going to have all these auto loading rifles, you know, like the SVT. You know, and they, they did make a lot of those, but it just wasn't enough to, to cover all the bases. So they kept the, uh, the Mazen in wartime production, you know, and kept it shorter, made it even more simple. You know, had, you had the M44 and then post-war you had conversions to like the M59 and, uh, you know, all sorts of stuff. And then they, they licensed out the design. You saw it made all over the, the, the communist empire, you know, in, in the 50s. You had the Chinese Type 53, which millions upon millions of those were made you know and it was a uh, that was a staple of the you know the vietnam war uh you saw them pop up in korea you've seen them all over the world in africa all sorts of, of, of different things you know when the uh reagan sent in the marines and the rangers into grenada in 1983 to make sure that the soviets didn't steal christmas by uh keeping all the nutmeg harvest, you know, because you can't have eggnog without nutmeg. Um, those, those stinking commies uh, in Moscow, they were going to, you know, basically steal Christmas by by keeping hold of all the nutmeg. Uh, after all the smoke was cleared, uh, they found warehouses full of, of mazas as well as, you know, all sorts of other uh, flotsam and jetsam from the, uh, that the Russians and Cubans had supplied to the uh, fraternal brothers of the uh, uh, Peoples and Workers Army of Grenada. You know, that was going to be a big stepping stone, you know, turn Grenada basically into Nicaragua and, and kind of have, you know, an, an ally for Red Dawn. But but I digress, you know, it didn't, didn't work out too well, that whole communism thing, uh, at least organized communism. It's still around in its disorganized formats all over the world. But uh you know, the Cold War ended and all that stuff became military surplus. Uh, gosh, I remember when I was uh, working the gun counter in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, and, and there was like the Navy arms catalog, you know, floating around. Everybody loved Navy arms back in the day because you could get like English Brownings for like 300 bucks. They had a uh, surplus Chinese Type 53s for like $60. You know, and it was like, was that a misprint? That can't be right, you know? And then you saw all the other uh, Mazins come out, the, the 9130s and all that stuff. And they were they were so covered in cosmoly, so just raggedy. But the neat thing is, you know, the, the Russians had, after World War II and, and Korea kind of settled down, they had Arsenal refurbished all these guns and, and made them almost like new you know, even if they had to force match the parts, you know, you saw all this weird electro pencil stuff come in uh, to make the serial numbers match. And they, you know, re-blued and recoded everything and then then dunked it in you know, a, a, an ocean of cosmoline and put it in storage for 30, 40 years until the end of the Cold War. And they sold it for, pitting, you know, uh, 
pennies on the pound, basically. So that translated into you saw them everywhere, just absolutely everywhere. They were, and like you said, they were garbage rods, you know, because you would go to gun shows at the time and they would have garbage cans uh, set up like 55 gallon garbage cans uh, with, you know, just stacks of mazen shoved in there and you would grab, you know, one or two, you know, out of the thing and, and start haggling. And they had all the stuff with them. I mean, you had the the sling, the oiler, you know, that Mickey Mouse oiler. Yep. And that, all sorts of stuff. And it was just, just cool, you know, and that persisted for a long time. You know, you could get those basically for about a decade, decade and a half. And, uh, you know, $99, $89, $79. And it got to be where guys just bought them and hacked them up and, and you know, sawed the, the bayonet off of like the 44s because you couldn't ever unscrew it. it you know, every time you tried to unscrew it, you'd break a screwdriver. That steel was so tough. So guys would just like dremel off the bayonet, you know, and give it a rattle can job. And you've never enjoyed uh, having your shoulder knocked out of place till you shot an M44 uh, a lot. You know, it, that's a, that's a, that's a, got a got a mouth on it that gun you got a big ball of flame you got know, that it's a pretty stout recoil again with a 30 out six you know yeah that integrated bayonet super uh super sick but yeah there's no way to get that off <laughs> just gotta cut that cut that piece of block down man That's, it happened a lot you saw oh, yeah. guys they'd dribble it off you know and then they'd spray paint it and you know, add Uncle Mike sling to it, and they'd be like, "Oh man, it's my truck gun, man! I got a buck fifty in it. I love it." And you know, you could buy a spam can of like four hundred and forty rounds. You know, and it had like that weird smelling, uh, greasy cardboard wrap in it. You know, and make your your hands all greasy. You got stains on your pants from it. And it was just weird ammo, but it still shot, even though you know it was probably uh, canned back around the time that. You know, the Hitler was hiding out in the bunker, you know, so I mean, it's, they're interesting guns, you know, and they get a bad rap because they were so cheap for so long. People just thought they were garbage, you know, but there was a lot of materials that went into making these guns. There was a lot of factories that made them 24 seven, even under extremely dire wartime conditions where like you got to think that the especially you see those wartime uh, model 44s and stuff. The people who were making them, they had kids on the front line. Their their husband had probably got zapped when the, the Germans came in in 41. You know, all their sons got hauled off to fight whether they wanted to or not. You know, so, I mean, it was uh, they were there doing their bit for the war while their whole family may be behind German lines, you know, because they evacuated those factories, you know, to the Urals and stuff. And uh, the Russians just kept cranking them out, you know, in giant quantities. So the, the guns definitely tell a story and you can, you can pick them up and kind of appreciate that story. And, and I think people started really getting into like kind of collecting them and stuff when, uh, you know, it was like enemy at the gates came out, you know, which is, is a horribly inaccurate movie. Movie. Yeah. You know, like the, the German didn't even exist. And Vasily Saitsev was more propaganda than, than actual. And I'm sure I'm going to get flamed out in the comments on, on this from, some Zaitsev fans out there. I'm not saying Zaitsev didn't exist. He did. But, like, you got to take all of the the Soviet wartime boasts. Propaganda, and, yeah. Just meeting with a, a serious grain of salt, you know. But, and then they were trying to inspire their guys. So, I mean, of course, they're going to inflate their heroes. I mean, everybody did it to an, uh, one degree or another. The Russians just kind of Baghdad bobbed it the most, you know. And for, I mean, probably for good reason, they lost more than anybody else did, including the Germans, you know. So, uh, you know, if, if all your heroes are dead, I guess, you know, you don't have a lot to aspire to. So the ones that you have still alive, you got to kind of pump up a little bit. Uh, but, you know, nowadays, those Mazins, they're still super collectible. And they're not $69, $79, $89 now. But, you know, people are out there and they get all into the different variations. I mean, I think there's like more, five or six different variations of just the 44s. And there's like the camel carbine yep. and the back to the older like Cossack and Dragoon models that the Tsar had. And most of those, 
the only way they still existed was if the like the Finnish or the Poles or something had captured them during the uh, Russian Revolution, Russian Civil War era, and just kind of put them in the arsenal, and didn't do anything with them, and then they wound up being sold as surplus in the fifties and sixties or whatever. You know, so that's the only reason why those guns are still around because you know the Russians, uh, once they became you know the Soviets, they kind of took all those older models and, and homogenized them out into the ninety one thirty. You know. Yeah, and before we get into that, you know, the uh, the Mosin is still <laughs> one of the more affordable surplus rifles out there on the market. It, it's not sixty bucks anymore. It's not ninety bucks anymore. I think I paid eighty nine dollars for mine, but uh, you know, it's still extremely collectible. So we have this little program out there called the We Buy Guns program. It's the way that we stock out our extensive certified used uh, inventory here at guns.com. Maybe you have a Mosin that you bought for 60 bucks. Uh, you can make a make a little bit more than $60 these days on a, on a rifle like that. Or maybe this has inspired you to start your surplus collection by picking up a Mosin. Either way, be sure to check out the We Buy Guns program. We've done our best to virtualize the pawn shop process. So that it's all online. You just go on, submit a little information, a couple photos. We'll send you an offer. If you like that offer, we'll send you everything you need to uh, ship us the gun, pay you out by check or direct deposit. And you can turn right around and check out our certified used inventory. We have one of the largest used firearm inventories in the United States. And uh, I kind of want to go back towards the beginning of the Mosin. Uh, you were talking early on about how the rifle was produced and worked on uh, by different countries. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe Westinghouse in the United States uh, made Mosins for a couple of years in the early 1900s, if I'm not correct. Yeah, well, you know, during, during the war, you know, I, again, the, the, Russian industry was, was not very sophisticated and was not developed for a country of the size they were. I mean, back in the, at that time period, Russia had like 130 million people, which was just a gigantic country. You know, if you look at populations in the, the 1900s, 1920. And uh, so, you know, when the, the Great War came and the, the Russians had so many armies just destroyed outright, uh, by the Germans in 1914 and 1915. They held their own pretty good against the Austrians and the Turks, uh, quite good against the Turks, actually. If you look at any of the campaigns that they fought against the Ottomans in the uh, Caucasus Mountains, uh, they, they licked those guys up and down, you know, um, and they, they did well against the Austrians in Galatia. But, you know, when it came to uh, fighting the Germans in Poland and East Prussia, they just got stomped. You know, they lost the first army group in August 1914. Uh, the the second army uh, right before that, you know, uh, the, the famous Tannenberg battle, you know, Samsonov rode off in the woods and ate his pistol, you know, because he couldn't face the czar. Um, then they just kept losing armies to the, the Germans in 1915. And what not only was it men who could be replaced and keep in mind the czars were able to, the czar was able to mobilize something like 15 million men uh from all over the country the rifles couldn't you know all the rifles those guys lost and were just picked up by the thousands uh by the germans and the austrians and turned around and used by them in some cases especially for like rear guard units and guys guarding prisoners and stuff uh the czar couldn't whistle up a couple million new Mosins overnight. So the next best thing was to reach out to the great neutral uh, America at the time. And the czar's uh, contracting guys just showed up with, you know, rules good as gold, literally, and uh, started placing these big contracts. They bought machine guns from Colt. They bought Colt 1911s. You know, it was a Russian 1911 contract. Uh, they went to Remington. They went to Winchester with both of those. They wound up with uh, Mazen contracts. Was the, it's the eighteen ninety Winchester eighteen ninety five? I believe they got a bunch of those. Yeah, yeah. They bought uh, lever guns. They bought uh, lever guns mm -hmm. in seven point six two five five four. four and they yeah. armed with them, you know. And the those guns did horribly on the Eastern Front with all that mud. You know, if you take a big lever action rifle and the, the eighteen ninety. Uh, fives were just brutal guns, you know, because they had this big giant 
action, you know, lever action, you, you crank that down into the mud a couple of times and you're not getting that unstuck anytime soon, you know. Uh, but they, they did, you know, they bought all sorts of guns in America and a lot of those were uh, a couple of special uh, Mazen contracts. And a lot of those guns never got delivered to the Russians because uh, of the Russian civil, the Russian revolution, which deposes our, and the, the follow on Russian uh, civil war, which you know, it knocked uh, the Russians out of the war and they started fighting amongst themselves for the next several years while uh, the, the Western allies took care of, of Germany, the Ottomans and uh, the Bulgarians and, uh, uh, all, you know, all that and it wrapped itself up. But these guns, a lot of them never went, never got delivered. They sat in storage in uh, Murmansk and Vladivostok where they were shipped by American ships and they just stood on the docks. So when the Americans intervened in the Russian Civil War, uh, starting in March 1918, uh, some of those R American units actually armed themselves with American-made, you know, moisons. So that's the kind of a weird story where the U.S. Army uh, used American-made moisons in Russia. Uh, they weren't officially fighting the Reds. They weren't officially supporting the whites, but there there was some several sharp engagements where, uh, you know, the eggs got broken, so to speak, you know. So that's a, a another kind of lost bit of military history. That the, <coughs> excuse me. Is Mazen's. And they, they used them even more extensively than that. They were used for training purposes. Uh, they were used as, all, all the way up into World War II. For, you know, so it, it's kind of an American story as well, you know, so. Yeah, and, and kind of moving past that, <clears throat> excuse me. One of the interesting things, too, and, and maybe one of the more overlooked wars that's out there, um, which I think is pretty unique to the story of the Mosin, is the Winter War, right? So you have the, the Winter War prior to, to World War II, um, and the evolution of the Finnish Mosin, right? So you're talking about all the different variants out there. You've got American-made, French-made, uh, finally Russian-made. You've got the old actual 91s and the dragoons then you get into the 9130s now all of a sudden the fens are capturing not only rifles but factories and uh taking some of the receivers and rebarreling them um and and the finnish mosins the m39s uh some of those are considered to be some of the more accurate um extremely well made uh kind of much tighter tolerances than you would get on a a regular 9130 but that finnish mosin is another you know model that's kind of held up there in high regards in the in the collector community or the surplus community uh, and there's just an interesting history there about you know nobody really know in the united states at least we don't really talk about the winter war uh that much or or what went into that um, but I think that's an interesting tidbit as well. If you'd like to discuss the the evolution of of the Finnish, you know, part of the Mosin history. Oh yeah, in, indeed. You know, um, you know, Finland had been a, a kind of a, pro, a provincial uh, area of Sweden for uh, generations and generations, and then the uh, the Tsars beat Sweden in a war uh, in the eighteen hundreds and wound up with you know. Finland as a prize from that and it became the Grand Duchy of, of Finland and it was kind of a semi-autonomous region of Russia you know they uh, were still garrisoned by the Russians and the Russian Navy had a big base there and uh, but in, in World War One, you had Finnish units that both fought with the Russian army and with the Germans against the Russians you know for independence so that was kind of a, a, a deep dive into uh a war for independence there uh, that a lot of Finns, uh, they had the Jaeger groups fighting with the Germans. Uh, so that was uh, an important thing for them. And then once the, the Russian empire fell apart, uh, you know, Finland had their own kind of civil war there for several weeks, you know, where they had groups of communists fighting white guards, uh, which were the, the Finns who were anti-communist. And uh, eventually the, the, uh, the Reds lost and the Mannerheim and, and the boys kind of uh, brought it out, you know, uh, formed an independent uh, Finland and secured the border. And they managed to keep the Russians out until 1939. 
Well, you know, since the, they had captured all these uh, stocks of uh, Mosin rifles during the 1917-1918 period, uh, they put them all to good use, you know, even though they had wound up with some supplies of Mausers uh, from uh, the Germans after the war. Uh, they also had a, a much larger stock of Mosins, so they used those, and especially with the Finnish Civil Guard, and they put some into local production as well, like uh, Valmet, which is, you know, now part of, of Seiko, now part of Tika, now part of Beretta, if you want to, you know, kind of chase that down. Uh, they made, you know, models for the, the Finnish Army and the Civil Guard, which was kind of like, it's it's wrong to say it was the National Guard because it was a little bit different than that. But it's about the closest thing you could think of to the Finnish Civil Guard was the, the American National Guard, you know. And uh, that's what Simo Heia, the, uh, the, probably the most famous sniper uh, in the world, uh, that's what he used was a, a, a Mosin that he learned to use during his civil sir, uh, civil guard period. And when he was called back up to active duty, you know, even though the, the Finns had access to uh, Swedish Mausers, including some sniper models with uh, optics on them, he, you know, was like, no, nah, that's good. I'll use my, my Mosin. That's what I'm used to, you know, and that's what he used very effectively. Um, he also used a, a, a Swami submachine gun for, for some other stuff. But uh, that was, it was his like go to was the, the Finnish made Mosin. And he used it very effectively uh, for those very few weeks of the, the Finnish winter war and went down in history for it. Uh, a lot of those Finnish guns were, you know, just beautifully made. And if you pick up, you pick up like a uh, M28 or M39, and it's it uh, the action feels a lot different than kind of the, the the more shaky, rough action that you get on an M, a regular Russian M91. Even though a lot of the the Finnish guns started off as standard Russian M91s and got reworked over time, you know. Uh, and then there's the whole there's a saga of the the Finns. If you you ever have a friend that's Finnish. They will never, ever say they got defeated or were on the losing side in World War II because, like, they're, they're part of World War II. They call it the Continuation War, yeah. you know. After the Germans invaded uh, Russia in '41, the Finns got active again, um, and they, they fought what they called the Continuation War against the Russians for several years and managed to negotiate at the end of the war a uh, not a great – uh, peace treaty, but at least one that kept Finland intact. And even though they had arms limitations, and part of that arms limitation was they couldn't, you know, make any any new guns. They couldn't have submarines. They couldn't. There's a lot of little minuta uh, to it, and it only really kind of expired in in more recent years when uh, you see Finland today, and they're now part of NATO and all that. But uh, you know, for a long time, they were kind of under the the thumb of the 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 soviets after world war ii and as much as they were making mazins that were kind of off the books you know they were like oh these were old mazins that were just laying around these aren't new guns you know so the serial numbers and the the time date period on those are a little funny and that's that's kind of a, a neat little uh bit when it goes to mazins and it's it's such a rich history on these guns i mean a lot of people really are like, you know, the terrible you know but there were there's so much history behind them these guns showed up in the uh spanish civil war you know the, the russians sent tons of them you know to the the spaniards so they were floating around spain during that um they were used of course in, in world war ii they were used all over the place during the cold war uh in korea and vietnam uh, there's several of them that were brought back by uh, gis from those eras so it's if you run across a Mazin, don't just look at it as a, a $60 garbage rod. You know, look at it as a gun that's got a lot of history to it. It may have been absolutely in its, its time period, you know. Uh, and it's it's still, oddly enough, it's one of the very few uh, 19th century uh, military arms that's still in production. Uh, like in Russia, it's still made by Molot and a couple other... Uh, places as a, a hunting arm you know it's not in military production anymore but it's still made out of the arm there you know so uh in, a, in weird calibers like 366 tkh and stuff you know because uh, russian uh civil 
gun rights are pretty bad, you know, so it's, it's, it's pretty tough to get anything decent as a Russian gun owner. Uh, you can't go get your own Kalashnikov, you know, but you can buy a Mazin in a, a crazy caliber. Uh, it's brand new, you know. I mean, it worked for, what, 130-something years. I guess it'll still work for another 130 years. Yeah, uh, you know, and, and getting into that, uh, the best place, you know, we were talking about all this history, all this kind of reviews on this rifle, um, even things like Finland coming into NATO, a lot of that stuff you can stay up to date with by checking out the uh, news and content side of guns.com. We have a great team who's dedicated dedicated to bringing you guys um, you know, the, the newest, the greatest, the latest, uh, what's going on in the gun world. Um, a lot of, obviously, military news, military history that's going on. But be sure to go to guns.com backslash news so that you can stay up to date with uh, all the happenings going on around the world. Yeah, to your point, it's, it's probably the easiest gun to overlook. It's probably the easiest gun to be like, ah. Eh, it's not that cool or it's just this cheap, you know, my, my dad is a Cold War veteran and anything Russian made is just a communist piece of crap. And I think it's pretty easy to have that opinion, but I'm pretty sure the Mosin has been involved in, you know, every major war since the 1890s. Uh, and it, again, like we were saying, it, it's still used today. It's still being found on the battlefield today. Uh, it's, it's prevalent throughout Africa. It's prevalent throughout Asia. It's prevalent throughout, um, obviously prevalent throughout Europe, considering all the former com block countries that either have massive stores of them or made them themselves. You know, there's, there's Romanian Mosins out there, right? There's Hungarian Mosins out there. Uh, there's a lot of different <clears throat> models that you can really get into, Probably even some Mosins found their way down to Antarctica with some of the uh, some of the Russian, uh, you know, scientific adventures down there. But it's just hard to kind of fathom a rifle that's pretty much touched just about every continent and every country uh, and, and is still extremely relevant. And, you you know, I think we, we talked a little bit uh, on a previous podcast about the surplus market and that there's a little bit of a. A false inflation with certain models. Uh, I, I certainly think that that's true of the Mosin, the supply of Mosin Nagants and the surplus Mosin Nagants are not necessarily running dry. But in times like now, uh, you know, in, in in countries like Ukraine or in countries like Russia, Belarus, um, a lot of those surplus crates are getting opened back up and and thrown around. Uh, so the the imports start to dry up and obviously there's some import restrictions considering that there is an active war going on and that's what drives a lot of those prices up it's not like the gun is any less popular or you know the numbers have shrunk or anything like that it's just the uh, availability in the United States uh, but you know it's crazy to see the progression of that firearm both from a historical standpoint and just from a military surplus kind of collectors. Like I remember you'd be able to get like, tell me I'm wrong. You used to be able to get like a crate of Mosins for 650 bucks. You know, like there were guys, I, I remember was a this. Cool crate too. Yeah. A crate into a tank. Yeah. So I was, I was about to say, I remember some guys who would take them and they would just put a, a, like lights in the in them and put a glass you know piece over the top and just turn it into a this is a cool little gun table. Um, now worth a little bit more. So those people out there who poured resin into those freaking crates, yikes! Um, you know I'm I'm as a as a surplus collector, I'm anti sporterization of you know military firearms. I just it it hurts me. You know it's like you come across. A 1917 that's been all hacked up or a k98 and you're just it hurts it hurts my soul and it used to never really hurt me when i saw cut up mosins i'd be like yeah whatever it's a mosin there's a gajillion of them out there like who cares all you know the the big rave was i think battlefield one came out the video game and everybody started making those obrez pistols uh, oh, that. yeah, I, and that got, that got nuts. Um, but you know, it, like you said, it's really easy to just throw this 
little firearm off to throw this really cheap Russian rifle to the side. And you'd be hard pressed to find another firearm model that has been as involved and has such a deep history with so many countries, so many variants um, than the, than the Mosin Nagant. And uh, it is one of the most incredible when you really get into it. And I'm not saying it's the most accurate gun in the world. I'm not saying it's the most reliable. I'm not saying it's the best. I'm just saying that when you look at the development of that firearm, and, and like I said, starting off, 7.62 by 5.4R has survived 130 whatever years, 133 years. Um, you know, it's it's still in service with the PKM, still in service with heavy weaponry in, in a lot of countries, you know, not just Russia, but a lot of uh, former Comblock countries. It's still in production today. You can't really say that about any other rifle caliber of the time. You know, obviously 30 out 6 is still in production, the 65 suite is still in production, but it's all been relegated to, you know, hunting rifles or sporting uh and in military service. It it does speak to the success of, you know, the the design and uh, you know, all that effort that was put into it, the fact that it still exists, it's still around today. And uh, you know, a lot of those firearms, a lot of those 762 by 54 r you know, firearms are considered extremely reliable, uh, very robust, um, and and I, you know, just about everything that the Russians make. Uh, my dad always says that you know whatever the Russians make, it's not made for precision, but it's made for longevity, and uh, that's uh, that's kind of the the idea that they have with their firearms. And it's crazy to see uh, such deep. Uh, you know, rooted historical rifles out there. Like I said, they're still available. Now, a little more expensive than uh, than what you were going to get out of a catalog back in the day. Um, But, uh, you know, when we talk about getting into collecting and and military surplus, and I discussed this with Ian McCollum and me and you have talked about it, you know, it's still kind of an entry-level surplus firearm. And uh, it shouldn't be scoffed at. It shouldn't be something that's like, ah, it's just a Mosin. You know, like it's it's a really solid historical firearm. Um, and if you see one, you know, pick one up. There, there's Like you said, there's so many variants out there. You've got the hex receivers, the, the Dragoons, the, you know, the Finnish Mosins. I've seen guys print on with surplus ammo. I, I think uh, Nine Hole Reviews took a... Uh, m39 out and with surplus ammo they were like sub three moa uh on iron sights which if you think for a mosin with surplus ammo that's pretty impressive uh you know there there's some really cool just awesome historical pieces and variants that are out there and uh the the point that i'm trying to make is it, it really is one of the most overlooked but one of the coolest rifles uh, to, to ever go into production and, and definitely one of the coolest rifles to hit the surplus market. For sure. You know, and I mean, if you think about it, if you're a, a Russian guy or a Ukrainian guy, uh, you know, our age today, you, you could unfortunately be handed a, a, a Mazin and, and be told to go guard this or, or charge that, you know, and, you know, that Mazin may have been used by your, your father, you know, back during the, the communist era for training and, you know, they had the, the uh, school uh, training and like a ROTC program in the school that was mandatory, you know, where they brought arms in and then you had to learn how to field strip an AK and, you know, go to the range and shoot a Mazin and, and things like that, you know, so your father may have used it back then and then your grandpa may have used it during his military service in the, the 50s as a drill rifle and your great grandpa may have carried it you know, during the, the Great Patriotic War and his his yeah. father before him carried it during the Great War against the Germans and, you know, then even going further back, may have carried it against the Japanese in 1904, you know, so I mean that at gun as 120 years old at this point and still being used, you know, so I mean, it, sure, that's kind of a far out example, you know, but it's it's theoretically possible. You know, that these guns, you just wouldn't see that today with, like, say, a 1903 or, you know, some French guy. They're they're not going to hand him a Berthier or a LaBelle. (laughs) Or a LaBelle, yeah. The the armory for 100 years, you know. If you're you're British, you're not going to get handed an old uh, 
uh, SMLE Mark III, you know. So yeah. I mean, it's really kind of had to look at the longevity of the uh, the Mazen design and kind of you know salute it because the Russians still had it in service as a, a backup uh, squad uh, marksman rifle alongside the SVD in the 60s. The Finns still had a variant uh, that they used as a sniper rifle uh, through much of the Cold War, the 60s and 70s. You know, the same thing with the Yugoslavs, you know. Uh, these guns were just out there. They were just out in service for a long, long time, and they're probably still going to be in service for decades to come. You know, if if my grandson is sitting on whatever, you know, they, they call a podcast in the 2050s, and, you know, he could be like, oh, the Mars and the God, you know, that Joker's still in service fighting on Mars today. Yeah, you know? seriously. <laughs> No, absolutely. And, and absolutely. you know, even for the United States, like we, we ran into Mosins overseas in, in the Middle East. Uh, we run into them, obviously, with operations in Africa all the time. Um, you know, they've, there's been a lot of U.S. wars where we've, uh, we've been pinned up against Mosin Agads from Korea all the way up, uh, all the way up till today. Um, still just a prevalent gun. So it's just, like I said, it goes to, to show what a rich and deep history the 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 garbage rod has this this crappy soviet bolt action rifle um I'm, i love history i love taking something like that you know they're they're still super shootable uh i think i bought me and my brother bought a couple of those 440 round spam cans back in the day and i think at the time i was thinking like oh it's only 440 rounds we should probably get two and i think i, I you know it's you take a Mosin to the range and you shoot 15 rounds and you're like, that was fun. And then it's like, I'm never going to get through this 440 round, you know, spam can. Luckily I have an SVT that I can take out and, and maybe burn some of that up with. But I just remember thinking like 440 rounds, that's nothing, you know? And then, yeah, it's on the range. The, the Mosin's not slinging rounds all day kind of rifle, but, uh, like you said, just just Especially you're using like a 44 or something. Oh man, yeah, that no. thing gets kind of abusive. My shoulder and collarbone can't take that, you know. It's between that yeah, and the, uh, like that. it's between that and the Steyr M95, the cut downs uh, from the from Nazi Germany. Uh, we'll have to do a podcast on that. That's another good uh, good firearm to get into. Also, a very interesting gun. Yeah, super With long interesting. legs. Yeah, long legs. Uh, but thank you guys so much for checking out this episode of Two Guys, One Gun, brought to you by Guns.com. We here at Guns.com are trying to be your one-stop shop for all your firearms needs. If you are interested in the Mosin Agat, maybe learning some more, you can check out our news tab. Uh, if you've got a Mosin Agat that's turned into quite the investment over the years, you can check out our We Buy Guns program. And uh, maybe if you're looking to pick up a Mosin, like I said, we have one of the most extensive used firearm uh, inventories on the internet. So be sure to scroll through those virtual aisles of guns and guns and guns and guns. But thank you guys so much for me, Mr. Alexander, and Mr. Chris Eager. Uh, we'll catch you guys on the next episode.